welcome to this week's episode of English 9 for the week of June 1st. This covers portions of Lessons 1 and 2 in both the Digital Pathway as well as the Print Pathway. I'm Carrie Lockery, a resource teacher with the Office of Secondary English Language Arts. It will be helpful if you gather all of your materials before we begin. By the end of the lessons today, you'll be able to analyze the elements of tragedy, apply the elements of tragedy to Act 5 of Romeo and Juliet, and then in Lesson 1, you'll argue which element of tragedy is the strongest in Act 5, but in Lesson 2, we'll talk about creating a two-minute tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Can you think of an example of a tearjerker movie? What makes that movie so sad? And what could make a movie have a sad ending? How is the audience supposed to feel at the end of a sad movie other than just feeling sad? Over the past several weeks, we've talked about plot structure. We are now at the resolution. So what is a resolution? Well, it's the conclusion. It's a type of ending. It's also where we hope all the questions are answered and solutions are found. Characters are fully developed by this point. And a reader can look back and see how the plot progressed, as well as how the characters were developed over the course of the story. Before we can fully understand the resolution for Romeo and Juliet, we should review Act 5. Scene 1. Romeo discovers Juliet has died from his servant Balthazar and is devastated, saying, I defy you, stars. He buys some poison from an apothecary and returns to Verona to visit Juliet's tomb. Scene 2. Friar John reveals to Friar Lawrence that due to an outbreak of disease, he was quarantined in Verona. As a result, Romeo did not get the message letting him know that Juliet isn't really dead. Friar Lawrence worries about what may happen as a result and says, unhappy fortune by my brotherhood. The letter was not nice, but full of charge of dear import and the neglecting of it may do much danger. He then quickly hurries to the Capulet tomb. Scene three. Paris visits Juliet's body to mourn her death. He is disturbed by Romeo. They fight and Romeo kills Paris, although he doesn't realize who it is at the time. Romeo then goes to see Juliet's body and takes the poison and dies saying, eyes look your last, arms take your last embrace. Friar Lawrence finds Juliet just as she is waking up, but she refuses to come with him. The noise frightens the friar and he leaves Juliet behind. She takes Romeo's dagger and kills herself saying, O oh, happy dagger, this is thy sheath. There rust and let me die. The prince arrives and discovers the dead bodies in the tomb and the Capulets see Juliet with a knife wound. Finally, Lord Montague arrives and tells us that Lady Montague has died in grief of my son's exile has stopped her breath. The friar returns to tell everyone what has happened. Capulet and Montague agree to end the feud that has taken so many lives with Lord Capulet saying, O oh, brother Montague, give me thy hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. You may remember learning about the characteristics of an epic hero. Today we're going to look at a tragic hero and how these elements coincide with the plot progression of Romeo and Juliet. The next several slides follow the resource located in the Learn About It and Try It. As we go through these slides together, you can fill out your graphic organizer. There are six elements of tragedy. For this lesson, we will focus on the structure and the character. The prologue outlines the play. Because Acts 1 through 2 describe the cause, in other words, the events that produce an effect, Acts 3 through 5 show us the effects or the results of those actions. The prologue helps us to understand the serious magnitude of the play. By the end of Act 1, we also understand the seriousness of the prince's order to cease all public quarreling. So what about the characters? They need to be famous or of significance. The Capulets and Montagues are both alike in dignity. We can assume they are wealthy and powerful families in Verona based on the multiple details from the play. The central figure in a tragedy is destroyed in some complete way. After finishing Romeo and Juliet, we know that both central figures completely destroy themselves tragically. 
A tragic hero must be generally good or noteworthy. The hero's fortune changes from good to bad. This character should be consistently developed over the course of a play and true to life, meaning that they seem believable. The hero will also bring his or her own downfall or destruction through a weakness, a character flaw, or a mistake. So would you consider Romeo a tragic hero? What about Juliet? They are both from noteworthy families. Romeo begins as a young and immature boy, but he's also affectionate and loyal and sometimes keeping the peace. We see him as romantic and sensitive, but then we also see his own pride and anger lead to his downfall and destruction. Juliet begins as innocent, obedient to her parents at first, and then we see her consistently honest with her feelings throughout the play. We then see that she becomes rebellious for a worthy cause. Would you consider her a tragic hero? Both characters are destroyed by their own actions and possibly their own character flaws. The flaw may be internal or external. It can be a trait such as pride or anger. However, it can also be a mistake caused by having a lack of knowledge. We see both in Romeo. In Act 1, he speaks with Benvolio about Rosaline's lack of love for him. Romeo is preoccupied with events that concern him, ruled by his own emotions, and believes his value comes from a relationship with a woman. These all are rooted in his pride and sense of self. We see his change in affection from one woman to another, showing his indecisiveness. He also exaggerates his abilities when he states that wings of love helped him to Juliet's balcony. This may also be evidence of his pride. By Act 5, we see that Romeo drinks poison because he never received the letter explaining Juliet's plan to fake her death. What about Juliet? In Act 3, Juliet wrestles with torn alliances, fails to think through the implications of marrying a Montague, and in fact marries someone she has known for mere hours. Does this prove her ignorance? Is she naive? By Act 4, we see Juliet's original obedience reverse when her parents ask, okay, they tell her, to marry Paris. She responds dramatically and emotionally, asking to jump from a tower, become a thief, lurk with snakes, chain herself to bears, or hide her with dead bodies. She fails to accept the consequences of her actions or to admit that she may have made a poor decision. The reversal in a tragedy is the moment where the hero's fortunes change from good to bad. When we think about the reversal, we should think about the climax. That leads us back to Act 3. Tabalt kills Mercutio, Romeo's desire for revenge causes him to kill Tabalt, and this will cause him to be banished, distancing him from Juliet, which sets up all the tragic events of Act 5. In scene four, Capulet promises that Paris may marry Juliet to help the family cope with Tybalt's death. Because of Juliet's dishonesty, Paris will not gain a wife or alliance with this family. And finally, by scene five, we see Juliet's refusal and continued dishonesty, and that causes her to be disowned by her parents. She must fake her death to live, and she depends on the friar for help. This ultimately leads to her death. Recognition is when in tragedy, as the hero is being destroyed, the moment where the hero understands what caused the destruction. In some cases, it's the hero's fault. In other cases, we see that it's fate. And in some cases, the hero uses this moment to express the theme of the tragedy. So in Act 5, Scene 3, Romeo responds after he kills Paris. He understands he has now killed the second person connected to Juliet. He was never meant to be with Juliet. And he says misfortune's book, which indicates his belief that fate is to blame. Now Juliet, later in that same scene, understands Romeo is already dead and he left nothing for her. Her only option is to die too. His timeless end. I will to make me. This indicates that Romeo was ruled by fate, but she takes fate into her own hands.
Remember when I asked you about the feelings you experience at the end of a sad movie, other than being sad? Those emotions caused by the tragedy are called catharsis. Shakespeare wants the audience to pity Romeo and Juliet and experience a sense of loss or grief. However, when the families unite, there is a sense of moral and spiritual renewal and hope for the future. We learn that forgiveness triumphs revenge and hatred. We are also reminded that unity is more important than being right. Finally, reconciliation should always be offered rather than meaningless feuding. For Show What You Know Lesson 1, respond to this prompt. In a brief response, argue which element of a tragedy is strongest in Romeo and Juliet. Also argue which element is the hardest to support in Romeo and Juliet. You may use text evidence from all five acts to support your answer. In lesson two, you will be asked to create a two minute tragedy. This is a great way for you to show that you understand the development of plot and character, as well as the major themes in Romeo and Juliet. In step one, you'll select the format. In step two, you'll select key lines from Romeo and Juliet that are most important. And in step three, you'll create a short commentary connecting the lines that you chose in step two from the element of tragedy that we just talked about in lesson one. You may, as an optional extension, record your two minute tragedy and see if you can make it just two minutes. I wanted to show you a sample for each format so you can decide which format would be best for you. Here is a sample script. The sample script will summarize each act. I have done act five for you. If I were to read aloud act five, it would take approximately 20 seconds. I included a line from Juliet and then commentary. You notice I bolded the word reversal to show that connection back to the element of tragedy. I also included a line from the prince and talked about how that is an example of catharsis. Storyboards are used for graphic novels and to create film versions for stories. This is a great format for visual learners as well as for creative minds. Your image could be your own drawing or a digital image you create to symbolize the lines of the play. Be sure you explain the element of tragedy represented. Posters are great to advertise films in a quick glance. How could you capture the attention of young people in a quick glance while offering a two minute synopsis of the play? For the illustrated Freytag pyramid, I began with a plot pyramid. I labeled each point on the plot pyramid. I then chose pictures that represented each plot point. My next step would be to choose the best line from the act. And then I would write commentary about the connection to the element of tragedy. This is a great choice for students who have kept their notes from the last several lessons. Thanks for sticking with me to the resolution of this lesson. There are additional resources available to you in the digital pathway on Schoology to help you with lesson two. Thanks for joining me today. This lesson is for GT9 English, the week of June 1st, and it pairs with lesson one. If you don't have the alienation and belonging chart handy, take a minute, find that, and as we go through the lesson, you can certainly check your answers on the chart if you've already done it, work on it together with me, or use it to add to what you already have. Before we start, though, let's think back for a second about illusions. In watching TV this week, I saw an ad for the Titan Games, a kind of physical challenge endurance competition. Well, why are the Titan Games a great title for this? Think about what brings to mind what's dug up when we talk about Titans. The children of gods and goddesses, rebellions, a 10-year war, and only after the end of this really vicious 10-year war are they finally defeated by the Olympians. So it seems as though if you're a Titan, that's an awfully good thing. And think about, too, how much better your TV is when you understand the illusions. Getting back to our themes for this lesson, we're going to look at alienation and belonging. These themes are really in opposition to each other. They're kind of opposite ends of the same continuum. And we're going to look at how to apply these to some of the texts that you've hopefully read over this year. Possibly you haven't read all of them, and that's okay. You might want to add them to your summer reading list because they're all great reads. As we look at these themes, as looking at any theme will do, 
it's going to bring some elements of the work into a more sharp relief, into a bigger focus, and it's going to make some things become less important. So think about how that's going to work out and how we're going to really start to think about being a part of something, being separate from something, and how that shapes our reading of the text that we're talking about today. So our first book is The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And this is very much a coming of age book. And the narrator and the main character, Esperanza, is really struggling sometimes with the lessons that she learns. Remember that coming of age is understanding the adult world and the trials and the tribulations of being a part of that world. And so one of the big ideas I thought about was how coming of age is about feeling that alienation and that awkwardness as you bump up against all of the unspoken rules of a group that you really want to be a part of, but you certainly aren't yet. Well, in one of the chapters, Esperanza's friend Sally is playing a game where she's really flirting with boys and enjoys giving them kisses on the sly. But Esperanza feels like the boys are just bullying her and keeping her keys away from her. So she goes off and she tells one of the boys' mothers about what they're doing, who just laughs them off. And in that, Esperanza feels this real sense of shame that she doesn't understand, you know, because Sally has this kind of maturity that she doesn't yet. And in that, it's really leaving Esperanza to feel very much separate from the group and a group that one of her closest friends, Sally, is certainly a really, really integral part of. If we move to belonging, the idea that's reinforced numerous times over the course of this book is that idea about when you stay within a culture or society that is the same as your culture, your society, that it's providing a kind of safety. Um, in a quote from the book, the author says, all brown, all around, we're safe. So for Esperanza, being in these towns and neighborhoods where it's a Hispanic culture, where it's families and cousins and friends that she knows, there is a safety. But when they leave that neighborhood and that familiarity and that sense of sameness, well, then that safety goes with it. And so what does it say about our idea of belonging and otherness that it doesn't extend to other groups? And then also, I think you can think of that idea of in the sense of coming of age, following the advice of older girls and women about how to wear your makeup, about whether or not you should wear stockings or to wear anything that's black and what that says about you as a person. And that's helping you to learn the rules and to become a part of that society that if we think back to our alienation example, Esperanza certainly felt left out from. Switching now to To Kill a Mockingbird, we're going to focus on Mayella Yule. So I think that for Mayella, being separate from the society because of their poverty, because of the incredibly poor behavior of her father, Tom, that they're kept out in a way that's very, very painful for Mayella because we really naturally want to become important in a group or in a society. We're kind of wired that way as humans. And in my opinion, that is really part of what leads her to misinterpret Tom Robinson's kindness. He's an African-American man. He's married. He's a father. He's a hard worker. And as he says at the trial, he feels sorry for Mayella that she's trying to maintain that house all on her own. And when he comes in and helps her and shows her kindness where no one else ever has, she doesn't understand that and therefore tries to kiss him, gets caught by her father, and that's the instigating event for the trial. But also, if we think about belonging, you can be a part of society. Tom and Mayella are white, and that gives them a kind of entrance into this group that Tom will never have entrance into, not in this time and not in this place. But even in your inclusivity, there can be a kind of alienation. And I think that idea of a kind of qualified belonging is really interesting. Let's think about, as an example, the verdict that they get in the trial. The Yules do get the backing of the jury and through them the society when Tom is found guilty. But they're still not accepted. And there's kind of the feeling of, okay, 
we helped you out. Now you can go back to your house and stay to yourself the way it's always been. And in that, I think that's a really kind of interesting look at, you know, both the idea of being a part of something and being kept out of something, even as you are a part of it. Take a minute, think about the examples that we've just gone over and see what you can think about with Octavia Butler's Kindred. Where do we see these ideas of alienation and otherness and where do we see ideas about belonging? Take a minute or so, see what you come up with. What did you come up with? I was thinking in terms of alienation for this book, it connects a lot with what we were just talking about with To Kill a Mockingbird. And this idea about acceptance, but in a qualified way. Think about how Dana is always a part of the society and not a part. It's weird because she does just kind of come and go in this weird sort of vanishing poof sort of way. But also people want to trust her, but she can't fully be a part of them. And so I think that if we looked at those examples about her otherness, about the skepticism that people have of her, about people who question her and her motives, that that becomes a really interesting way of looking at this book. I think if we're thinking about belonging is a really interesting idea. I don't know why that just erased, but thinking about the idea of family and thinking about what we're willing to do at all costs for family. If we're going to think about a supporting statement, Dana comes literally to save the life of Rufus every time. And so her life is put at risk. Think about how we need to think about who do you claim as your family and do you claim them kind of warts and all and think about how Tom and Rufus Whalen are not people that I think Dana necessarily feels happy about having in her family tree but yet they are essential to part of the foundation that her family has and in that she fights for them whether she wants to or not. Think about what other ways you might think about alienation and belonging and think about too, does this book as a science fiction novel allow us to think about these themes in different ways that some of the other novels that are more strictly true to their time period don't let us. In A Lesson Before Dying, we have Grant and Jefferson, and both of them are struggling with some really, really interesting ideas. Now, alienation doesn't just have to be based on race or culture, right? I think that in many ways, Jefferson is alienated from the society because of his lack of education and because he has a lack of understanding about particular situations. Would he have gone with the men into the bar when there was a murder? Maybe it was an accidental murder, but a murder nonetheless. And would he have ended up in jail? And so I think that if we think back to the example that I gave you in your packet, for example, of Mice and Men, where Lenny is also different in the way he understands and interacts with the world, is that causing a kind of alienation in a time 
both of these books are set in the 1930s, that people don't understand and that, again, those differences cause a kind of fear. And if we go back to belonging, I think we're also back to that idea of family and home that we just talked about with kindred and how regardless of all the challenges and limitations of home, it's home and it's where you belong. It's what you're a part of. And I think a great example of that is Grant and the way he talks about his job. It seems as though he hates his job and hates his community, maybe even hates his students. But nevertheless, he shows up every day and he works and he teaches and he's continuing the work that his teacher, who he really respected, had done before him. And so think about how that ties him into this place that is so much, for better or worse, a part of him. And then finally, let's take a look at John Lewis. The idea to which people are segregated and others can really become a precipitating factor for radical change. So in recognizing the kind of injustice of this othering and alienating, that it makes people want to act. And think about all the times that John Lewis put himself in harm's way, the times he was attacked, the times he was jailed, his skull literally broken open. And yet he continues to fight for the right to belong to the greater society. And then if we move over to the belonging example, finding your purpose and where you want to belong and what you want to be a part of is worth the risk that you take. Even something as simple as knowing he couldn't have gone to his choice of college. And instead of giving up, instead of accepting that, he writes to Martin Luther King, says, would you please help me get in this school? And that begins this just really astonishing relationship between Lewis and King that changes, I will argue, the trajectory of John Lewis's life, leading to where we are today with him still a member of the House of Representatives in Congress. I hope that this helps you to have some ideas about how you might look at alienation and belonging. I certainly want you to think about how all of our texts overlap and interact between time, between culture, between themes. And that's what I think is so great about the books that you read in GT9. And we're gonna continue talking about these kind of overlaps and interacts as we go through and get ready for some of our end of the year writing prompts. I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.